Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and good night. My name is Thomas T. Bird Canarian, and you are watching round two of the great email AI debate. That's right. I said round two of the great email debate. Talking about AI, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. And most importantly, let's get some of that uh, some of that great boxing match music coming in because we got two contenders coming in. All right, and coming in from the bot side, from Jay Orem and Action Rocket. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you Mr. Jay Orem. Jay, how's it going today, my bud? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you for coming by me. <laughs> good to see you. Good to have you in the in the uh, bot corner over here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in the email geek side, the marketing developer side of the of the ring, we've got Megan Bushhausen. Megan, how is it going? It is going. I'm going to hope my thoughts come together. I've been oh, sick. She's got I am this. better today. So we'll be <laughs> she's good. Got this. Looking forward to a good combo. All, all I've seen some amazing athletes compete while they're under the weather, and I believe she's got this, y'all. She's got this. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, love to see all the engagement going on in the uh, in the chat. Let's show us where you're coming from. Tell us where you're coming from. Hope to see you soon. Uh, all right, like I said, this is round two of the great email AI, AI debate. So, first and foremost, let's get some housekeeping stuff out of the way, shall we? Um, Okay, so questions. Please throw those in the question tab. Uh, we will save those towards the end of the Q&A portion of this webinar. Uh, and if you can also upvote the ones that you find more pertinent to the subject so we can kind of maintain the flow and keep that going. Um, also, yeah. So uh, let's go and begin the show. So I'll kind of want to just kind of, you know, just to do a high level brief of what we talked about last week. So we're here to talk about email geeks, you know, versus chat GPT, email marketing, all that fun stuff like that. So what is generative AI? Generative AI is training algorithms to create new data. It creates new information rather than just recognizing it and categorizing it, right? So it's out there. It's becoming more integrated and fast. But the main player is OpenAI, who launched ChatGPT for free in November. So uh, their launch made the barrier to entry to use an AI tool very low. So the chat interface part of it is the layer of tech on top of the GPT. GPT that increased its uptake so much. So another interesting fact that we got to share last week that Nicole Holden got to share. So I'm going to share it with you all really quick. But chat GPT has now become the most quickly adopted tech product in history. Over January two, uh, 2023, it had 100 million users and it took two months to get to this point. It took TikTok nine months to get to that point and Instagram 2.5 years. So that's pretty, pretty quick, pretty quick. But ladies and gentlemen, so with that being said, <laughs> Let's get into this round, shall we? All right. All right. So question one, what does ChatGPT really know about coding emails? Hmm. Okay. Let's go to the, uh, let's go to the bot corner. Jay, what are you thinking, man? So ChatGPT doesn't necessarily know anything about coding emails, but what it can do is interpret something that you ask it. So um, basically, the way GPT works is it generates text based on results that it's had previously. And the results are labeled by a human. So the bot or the machine learning that's behind this, it generates an answer to a question. And then a human will review it and say whether it's a good answer or a bad answer. And then by doing that millions and millions and millions of times, that's where it learns if it has a good answer or a bad answer. So technically, JetGPT knows nothing about coding emails. But it knows when you ask a specific question with specific words to give you an answer that is related to other answers that have been correct in the past. Um, so ChatGPT itself, as a tool, can give you things for coding emails, obviously, which is why we're talking about it. Um, but itself, it doesn't really know anything. Um, if we look a bit wider than that and look at um, GitHub Copilot, which is a tool that you can use to kind of help you write code um, by adding it to your code editor, that is trained on other people's code, which is open sourced. And it looks for patterns and things that people do over and over and over again. And so if they're looking at email templates from thousands or millions of people that have created them before, then if you start to write something, it will kind of give you something similar. Um, but it won't, it, it won't think about it. It won't be like, oh, Jay's asked for a button. I have to find him this really good email button that I have as an example. It will just think, oh, 100 million times someone's asked me for a button and they've all said it's a good answer. So I'm just going to give the same answer. So 
yeah, it it gives you the information, but it doesn't really know anything. Um, and yeah, and Mega knows like how the pitfalls of that can work sometimes. Yeah, I found when I messed around with ChatGPT for coding emails, I found that you really have to get those prompts right, which I think for especially an email can be really hard to do because ChatGPT does not know all those little nuances that we um, know as email developers. Like we know all those little quirks of the different email clients that we code in without really thinking about it a lot of the time. And without specifying the specific thing, ChatGPT won't know to give it to you. Uh, like if you want an email and you want it to work in Outlook, you have to tell it to work in Outlook. If you want those MSO comments, you have to tell it to do that. It's not gonna know to do that right off the bat. Uh, so I feel like when it comes to coding these emails, if you're going to leverage chat GPT, you really need to know those basics and fundamentals before you jump in. It should not be the main way you're coding emails or you're going to run into trouble way too fast and you may be putting bad code out there, which could just go wrong in all sorts of different ways. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. All right, that was round one. <laughs> I love this thing. All right. And we'll we go over that question one more time. So what did uh, Chad GPT really know about coding emails? And there you have it. All right. So moving on. Next question. Oh, looks like we got some examples. Jay and Megan, if you guys want to talk about those. Yeah. So I'll go first, I guess. This is one of my examples. So like talking about using Chat GPT, some people will try to use it for debugging. Um, I actually tried this back in February when um, we sent out a Valentine's Day email uh, if you're on our email on acid list, we send out this really awesome interactive build your own Valentine email. And it had a reset button so that you could build more than one and then screenshot it and send it to whoever. And I ran into an issue with it where I was dialing the reset button and it wasn't working on iOS devices. Uh, the styling wasn't coming in. I couldn't figure out why I had written the CSS. It looked correct to me. So I went to chat GPT and I asked it to style a form reset button using CSS. And this is what it spit out, which was essentially the same as what I had already written and it wasn't working and I didn't know why. So I revised the prompt to ask me it to work in iOS Apple Mail and spit out this other CSS, which I was not using. And I actually had not seen until doing, writing this prompt in chat GPT, which I thought was kind of interesting. But this still would not give, like, I know this would not give me what I wanted because I already know, knew the answer when I ran this part of it. My answer, I actually found it on CSS tricks. And I had to set that reset button to the dash webkit dash appearance button. Just that one little snippet of code is what I needed to make the whole thing work. And ChatGPT did not give this to me. I don't really even know what prompt I would have needed to get this type of result. It just shows that. If you don't know how to do something, um, you may grab that other code thinking it's correct, and then you have no idea how to fix it because you're relying solely on the AI to give you the answer. I went forward before. <laughs> you may have had an example, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's right. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's all, like Megan said, it's all about the prompts, but I don't know if that currently... I can't really tell if chat GPT is the problem or the people writing the prompts are the problem. Mm -hmm. So if the information is all there within chat GPT, but you don't know how to find it, is that chat, chat GPT is wrong or is it the person trying to find it is wrong? So there's whole courses that have like appeared on how to write prompts to get what you want out of AI tools. Um, so I guess it's similar to, um, I don't know, if you don't know how to search something on Google, Google is not necessarily a bad thing, but the person trying to write to search for something in Google might not get what they want. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a hard one to tech to kind of realize if is chat GPT any good at coding emails or are we just not writing the right prompts to get it to write the emails for us? Uh, yeah, that one's probably still up for debate and will be for a while, I imagine. <laughs> I feel like if you're going to spend all this time taking these courses for email development in particular, you you might as well take the course in email development, learn how to code the email. Like you're going to be spending more time adjusting your prompt to get what you want without no, without necessarily knowing whether it's correct or not, than just learning how to do it. Like just learn to do it. it 
and we'll get more into it, I think, with the next question about yeah. my more of my thoughts on that. <laughs> All right, all right. Let's move on to the next round, shall we? Great examples, everyone. Okay, so how much time could AI save an email developer? All right, let's start in Megan's corner. Megan, what are you thinking? <laughs> I was pretty much already going here. I don't think it will, honestly. <laughs> um, I think you spend more time, you'll spend more time QAing code and trying to fix it than whether or you just wrote it yourself. Like how many times, and I've gone through this a lot of times, how many times have you been dropped in someone else's code? You have to spend the time reading the code, getting what they're trying to do, kind of trying to figure out their thought process because not everyone codes the same way. Um, and say there's an issue, you can't really figure out the issue because you might not understand why something was written because there are no comments because there aren't always comments and all that jazz. And you end up saying, this isn't working, done. I'm, I'm recoding it. It's faster for me to recode this than to wade through this code and figure out the issue and fix it. And that's a lot of times how I run. You might as well recode it. Um, so in that instance, I don't think AI in its current iteration can help all that much for email code in particular. There, there are other uses for it um, that I think would be good. Um, like generating alt text, I think is a great use of AI because that's like the floor for accessibility and so many marketers miss that. Uh, that having AI um, help with describing an image, I think is great if we can train it up to do that really well. Um, but besides that, my refrain in all of this is going to go back to learn to code the email, learn email development if you want to be an email developer. It's going to serve you much better than learning how to try to use ChatGPT or any other AI engine to do it for you. And there you have it, folks. All right. And then coming from the bot corner, Jay, what are we thinking? So I did a bit of an experiment on Email Weekly a couple of weeks ago. Um, so essentially, I asked ChatGBT to, well, we asked loads of tools to basically do it from scratch. And all I did was do whatever AI did. I just copy and pasted it into my editor and sent it. Um, and we didn't do any testing either. And we built an email in about two hours or so. And we got this email that was responsive. It worked in most email clients, but wasn't great. And um, also we got um, the design to be done by AI and the images and the copy. So all of that within kind of two, two and a half hours, and um, we put everything together and it wasn't a completely bad result. And um, some pieces didn't work everywhere. Um, for example, the first button in the email, um, I just asked for a, can you create a link that's styled as a button with HTML and CSS for a, an email? And that register now, the red one, um, it completely broke on Outlook. And uh, as soon as I saw the code, I knew it was going to break on Outlook. But we left it so that we could see like how we could improve and see what AI was doing. And then the second lot of buttons, which are those green ones on the left, um, I actually rephrased it and said, can you create the same button but add support for Outlook on Windows desktop? And then it did give me something that was much closer to something that an email developer could write. Um, and the, those two buttons did render perfectly fine across quite a few email clients, and they looked great. Um, so it it can't really, as an email developer like me or Megan that does this day to day, I don't think like creating something from from scratch is not where this is going to help. Um, having it as a debugging tool where you can like put in some code and say what is wrong with this and give it a prompt to say I don't understand why this is not working. Can you give me some information? Um, or as a few people in the chat have said, if you're not familiar with a certain type of code, so maybe JavaScript, or um, if you're trying to figure out a, like a way to connect up a couple of different things or use an API which you don't know, then asking ChatGPT to kind of help you figure out what's going on. And then as a developer, you've got a bit more of an idea. So it would say like, oh, you've missed, missed a variable or you've not called the right thing or oh, this line is not correct. And it will kind of debug a little bit for you. But as the developer, you still need to have that kind of eye, I guess, for the code to figure out if it can help you or not. Um, but speed wise, it can really help you get a template that basically looks how you want it to in minutes. So uh, by just by typing in like for the whole email, I just typed in I want an email with a logo, a hero image, a title, body copy. CTA, then a two column module with images and text and a CTA, and then a footer that contains everything that's needed for like GDPR and legally. And then it spat out this template just in one go. Um, so without, and that was within like five minutes. 
Um, well, no, probably even less, actually. Literally, the time it took me to type it, it replied and it was done. So to create that, maybe it will do it. Um, and then I've seen a lot more plugins recently that are training the 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 like machine learning behind these tools that makes them a bit better. So if you've got a specific plugin that you've used that is trained specifically on your email code, um, so if you've got like a, I know Megan has done loads of talks about her design system and how she's put it together with modules and bits like that. If she gave all of that information to chat GPT and also gave it some documentation, maybe someone who isn't Megan could like ask a question and say, oh, I want to do this footer component for Malgun. Where's the code for it? What do I need to copy and paste? It could spit it out for you. And that is where I think AI could help email developers so i don't think it's going to help us at that very beginning to create the code or to create things like megan's amazing april fool's email which i'm sure she's going to share in a minute um but it can help people who may be more junior or assistants like get a little bit more information and it can do really mundane things as well so if you would need like to type out 20 check boxes to all have an individual name or id you can just type that in it will spit it out in like seconds you can copy and paste it and you're done rather than having to manually do that so I guess there's uh, tools for the right thing. But yeah, Megan, you said, you, you mentioned about the April Fool's email. Yeah, so I'm never ever going to escape this April Fool's email ever again, because I'm going to find every situation I can to bring it up. Um, so let me see where it is. Here. here we are. I call it my legendary MySpace email. So we sent this out last Friday for April Fool's. So I coded this, and I didn't take a screenshot of the code. I probably should have. Um, I coded this in a really specific way, and it was to look like code from back in like the early to mid aughts, like how the MySpace website was coded um, before they switched to all divs. It was all like tables and font tags and stuff. I didn't do font tags because that was just like way too much work for me to do um, each individual one. So I just stuck with our regular like table structure and using CSS to code it. Um, but what kind of prompt would I have to put into chat, chat, chat GPT, say chat spaghetti <laughs> to uh, get this? Like, I think it would have been really hard to make something like this happen via an AI um, and get it to work everywhere because it was quite a bit of work to get it, you know, functioning everywhere as I wanted it to. Um, so I just think of, you know, also special cases like this, where you really need somebody with the expertise to come in and handle it. I love this email so much. It's so cool. It just makes me miss my space so much. <laughs> oh, way to make me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So everyone, if you got to see that email, it's super cool. Um, if you get to take a look around, there's some, some good little snippets in there, some good little surprises. So take a look if you haven't already. It's on the email asset newsletter. So, all right. Okay. So as I have it here for our examples, let's move on, shall we? Okay. All right. So next question. Hold on. There we go. Will email AI be used dun, 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 for good or dun, 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 evil? All right, bot okay. section, bot. Yeah, Jay, let's see from um, your corner. What are you thinking? I've already seen it being used for evil, um, which is a bit disappointing. But basically, um, when I was trying to create that email weekly email using just AI, I just searched for copywriters, um, like copy AI or something like that, or subject line generators or things like that, and loads of results came up straight away for things like. Um, create a subject line for cold emails, create good copy for cold emails, create and um, get a load of email lists that are like just type in a company and get loads of emails from it, from it and automatically grab it um, and things like that. And creating kind of automations and funnels that would be like just repeating, sending the same email or stuff like that. Um, and all of those things came up within my first search for like AI to help with email writing. So I already know that the scammers that are out there are kind of already focusing on this and using it to their advantage. Um, we've seen like email and um, like it invites to us that have things like a video built in where the video is just like a floating head um, of like a salesperson. And it's um, they're kind of like it's just a made up deep fake video of their salesperson. And they just in insert the uh, the brand name 
take a rolling screenshot of your website and say, oh, we may be able to help with the content on your website. And all of this has been automated with AI. So they literally just send out a bulk email, deep fake all the videos, do everything like that and send it to like as many people as possible. And that obviously is completely, I mean, it didn't work on us. It was completely useless, but it means that they're getting those sales emails out there. Whereas before it would have taken them time. Now they can just press a button and it just goes out. So I'm not really sure. Yeah, that's not great. Um, and I just don't think that, that it's already going to be used for evil. But then we already know that email itself has phishing scams and all the other things that happen with email, even without AI being there. It's just AI is helping people do things more sophisticated than maybe they did before. Um, but I do, as well as that, though, I do think there are good uses for it. So all the things we already spoke about, like helping to debug, helping to do like basic templates, all that kind of stuff, it will be used for good by the people. Um, that want to do good and we know from all technologies that people will use technology for good and bad but yeah i think it's always difficult and me and megan have had many chats about the the like ethics behind ai so i, I will pass over to megan and i'm sure she will make all of the points that counteract me <laughs> all right megan let's hear your side yeah. um i guess anybody who knows me knows i am often looking at things from an equitable lens or at least i try to look at things from an equitable lens on how it affects people um so it, within email and outside of email as ai just gets huge across everything everywhere i really do think we need to take a step back and think about how this technology like affects us as a society and affects people's jobs and how it can, you know, hurt or help folks. Um, I agree with a lot of things Jay said, you know, we're always going to have people using technology for good and evil. And I think us as individuals have a chance to shape that. And we have to decide what, you know, what our values are and what kind of people we want to be. And if you're going to be using AI for like phishing scams, then that's kind of bad and not great place to be. Um, but hopefully you use it more for something like making your emails more accessible. Um, maybe you put your email code into chat GPT and it'll get to a place you can say, how can I make this email more accessible? And we'll spit out suggestions maybe. Um, if it got to that place, I think it would be great because accessibility in email is really hard. And as we know from Email Markup Consortium, um, their accessibility report from last July, um, like 99% of brands that they looked at were not accessible like at all, had very serious issues. So that's a place where I think AI could actually be really good. Um, but if you're not careful, you can start risking things like your deliverability. Um, you know, if you start ending up in spam because you're sending out bad code, therefore your emails aren't rendering well. So people are marking you as spam. Um, you wanna be really careful of things like that uh, because you know our goal is to make it in the inbox to communicate with people. So if you're using AI and not having any checks and balances in there to make sure those emails are good, uh, then you could do serious harm to your brand and nobody wants to see that happen. So say definitely tread lightly and be careful about it and you know make sure you're doing it for all the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. 100%, 100%. I can the, um, both those up, yeah. Yeah, on the accessibility point of view, there was one screenshot that I did take and included um, and that was, um, this one, after I asked for the Outlook specific button, this little note was at the bottom from ChatGBT version four. And it said, yeah, the code is quite verbose. Why don't you just use more flexibility? You may want to use an image instead of VML for your button. Um, so already, if you're kind of a, a new email developer and you're trying to figure things out and you're struggling with the code, it's already trying to give you this option, which is not accessible and not best practice for email. So it's probably picked that up across lots of people talking about it and saying, oh, it's not worth it. You might also use an image. So that it's not always going to give you the right answer. Um, so it, yeah, it could be it could be making it evil. If it's telling you to make ev e all image buttons, um, next it will be telling you to do all image emails. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's definitely not good. <laughs> I like that, Jay. And there's solid e for, for CTA buttons in particular. There is good code out there. Um, goodemailcode.com, Mark Robbins, I feel like we all cite that all the time, um, has really solid code that for CTAs work everywhere, even in Outlook. And there's Outlook specific code in there so that you don't have to use VML. I am an email developer that avoids VML at all costs. 
to the point where like I consider rounded buttons a uh, progressive enhancement. Like you're not getting rounded or rounded buttons, rounded corners. Like you're not getting rounded corners in Outlook. That's just the way I could, I roll because I'm not going to use VML if I don't absolutely have to. Um, so yeah, that, and that's that just shows another case where like ChatGPT doesn't know that code exists. Um, yeah, I guess I should say um, because it hasn't been fed into that into the machine. Um, so I think that's actually a really great example of where it could fail you a little bit. I like the way that Jay put it. It was if it's if it's telling you to do evil things, then it's probably evil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, everyone. All right. So, last question of the of all this of all these rounds and everything. Here we go. Here we go. Will Emi? Oop, that's the wrong one. Are we actually training bots to take over our jobs? All right, Megan. I want to hear from your corner on this one. What are we thinking? I don't think so quite yet. Not yet. Um, it's, it's too new. Uh, as we saw with the examples and discussions we just had, it's not going to give you everything you need. Um, email developers, we're, we're going to very much be needed. And I think if email developers start um, flooding the market who are relying on AI to code emails, but they don't actually know how to code, I think it's going to make those of us who know how the code works even more valuable. Like really understanding why things work, why they don't, the best way to do certain things in certain email clients, that's going to be to our advantage. There are a lot of people out there who are like, if you don't leverage AI, like you're going to lose your job. Like those who don't leverage AI are on their way out. And I, I do not believe that. I think our skill set will be needed more than ever. I mean, I also think about other jobs and other technologies that already exist, right? So like drag and drop editors exist. Um, you know, with Finch email, we have MailJet, that's a drag and drop editor, um, and they'll need me as the email developer here, so that existing doesn't put me out of a job. I uh, think about, you know, everybody has these high resolution cameras on their phones and can take a picture, but you're still going to be hiring that wedding photographer for your wedding, and you're still going to be hiring that DJ or that wedding band for your wedding. So. It really comes down to, it's gonna lower the bar for more people, but it's gonna make it obvious where that skill is really needed. Uh, and I think you're, you're gonna have to be really good at your job. Like, like if you're not that great of an email developer, you might be in trouble, but hopefully not. Um, but it's a really good reason to like really learn and you know, whatnot. And I feel like as email developers, you know, we are a scrappy group of people who just love to dive into this stuff and love to learn and we wouldn't be doing it we'd be off doing something else um so yeah i i think i think we're going to be okay for the foreseeable future in all honesty I, I really think we don't have to freak out yet jay how are you feeling what are you thinking <laughs> so I, I i agree with megan i agree with megan on a lot of things but i'm trying to trying to keep a, like a level view here um but things like um i don't think it's going to take our jobs but if you think about um, no code editors or drag and drop things, these have been around for a long time. And um, there was a really good blog from Josh Kumar who spoke about how Homestead was a drag and drop website builder. Um, we've all used things like Wix or Squarespace. Those all exist. Um, but then there's still web developers out there building things. So we know that even if you don't know how to code, there's a way to do things. But if you want something specific, so say... Um, an interactive email or like a special use case like the April Fool's one that Megan was talking about, then you're going to need someone who actually understands how things work and does the code. Um, but I do think that AI will start picking up things that are on the edge and things that maybe we don't need to be there for. So if you're, like I said, um, creating lots of code all at once and then us being able to edit it to make it a bit quicker, um, the lots of tools are bringing in AI like helpers so Dot Digital brought out their Winston AI assistant. Um, then I think um, Maljet and some others have got AI built into some of their products as well. Um, previously, Nicole and Julie mentioned uh, Grammarly, um, Phrasey, all of those AI tools, which we've kind of already integrated with things that we do already. And I think AI is not going to take over the full development jobs, but it's probably going to take over little things that we, for the moment, maybe they're jobs that are um, like, just repetitive, monotonous, same old jobs that happen all the time. And those are the jobs that are, that is going to take over, I think. 
and the with, there's still going to be need people like me and Megan to be able to create those out things that are outside of the norm and things that need to be like um yeah much bigger as well so yeah i think things like that but hopefully it will do things like make make things more accessible and bring code like the code for email to more people and then make it more accessible um so that people can actually like learn to code and i think that's a good thing that more people get the opportunity to learn to code maybe if you can't afford a course or something like that if you could go on to chat chat gpt kind of get the fundamentals work on it build some experience and then you go and get a job as a junior developer you kind of got a step up from starting where you hadn't before so i think there are things that it will help with and i did read that um i think that it will be coming for jobs that are like assistants or juniors and then the seniors and the leads and the heads of whatever they're going to be doing more of the win like the more complicated stuff but the easier things i think ai will take over it will just like add, like I said about GitHub Copilot, it gives you hints and tips to go along and that might improve your code. And as that improves, our code will improve and everyone's code will get better. And hopefully everyone will get more accessible emails and more uh, much better coded emails by helping AI to kind of spread that word. That's my hope anyway. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. Now we've got both opinions on whether either the AI will take our jobs or not. As long as Skynet doesn't come online, I think we'll be okay for now. There was something interesting that Megan shared, actually, um, which was there's like the thought leaders, like, um, I don't really like to call him a thought leader, but Elon Musk, loads of other people brought up this, um, um, what was it? It was like a, like those people could sign it and say. Um, I wanted to do a six month pause on all AI. What's mm -hmm. really interesting about that one, too, is I haven't read any of the follow up yet, but I also started seeing um, follow up articles come out that are against everything being signed. A lot of it is it's like a lot of anti Elon Musk people being like, this is why you shouldn't listen to Elon Musk about this, um, which I'm not going to get into that. Um, <laughs> and I haven't read any of those articles, so I can't really speak to them. But it's interesting to see because uh, from what I could tell, the people who are against the article from like the summaries I've read has said that the pause is almost like disingenuous. Um, so definitely like way more to read on that. I can't really give an opinion on it yet because I just haven't had a chance to like digest all of that. Um, <laughs> as we started getting closer and closer to this webinar, all this stuff just rapidly came out in like the last week and a half before. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I just don't have time to read all of this before the webinar. Um, so I have to go read all of it and you all should go find it and read up, and read up on it. Um, so the debate for and against who's genuine about it, disingenuous about it is definitely, a, it's a very interesting state to be in for sure. Yeah, and to, to add to that point also, another person that was actually on that list that I thought was uh, very uh, outspoken for the whole thing was Steve Wozniak. Yeah, I was gonna say Woz was... is on it. Yeah, that was a big eye opener for me. Um, I, I, his opinion, I would, I would love to hear more about, especially. I would take Waz's opinion over. Yep. You know, yep. Exactly. <laughs> Waz fans, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we have a few examples left that you guys wanted to talk about really quick before we get to some questions. Yeah, I think so. What you, okay. So I think these are mine. Yes, they are. All right. So I asked ChatGPT to code up an accessible email. Um, so this is what it spit out, which is not terrible. Like this is the floor accessible. Uh, this isn't the way I personally code. Um, I code with divs and ghost tables so I can have all semantic code in there. Um, rather than straight tables. But whenever you ask ChatGPT to code an email, I noticed that it defaults to tables, which is, you know, typical and probably because a lot of people coding email still code this way, which is like totally fine. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, one of the things I felt like was missing here is that in my templates, I tend to put my entire email in a containing div with some additional attributes. Um, which is here. So this is actually also from um, good email code um, from Mark's website. Uh, so you can see all the additional things that he has added. Uh, there's some like meta name stuff and whatnot that are needed for accessibility. Maybe I should take that out, but it's fine. Um, 
but you can see like, um, I can't annotate to really show. So like on line 28, you see that XML colon lang equals en. Uh, that's a language attribute specific to Outlook that Mark has recently discovered was good for Outlook. So that's a relatively new addition for accessibility things. Um, but more critically, we're adding like a, a um, ARIA landmark that role equals article on line 29 and some descriptions and labels. And that's all really important for screen readers that, you know, chat GPT just doesn't get because it doesn't know to add that sort of thing. Or I didn't ask it to add that sort of thing. And when I say code and accessible email in my brain, like it should be spitting out something like this and I shouldn't have to tell it to spit all this stuff out. Um, but because it's a machine and how, you know, programming always works, the computer always gives you back exactly what it tells you. It can't, it can't make those inferences. Um, I think that's the word I'm looking for and doesn't know and doesn't know how to make those decisions to add these things in or not. Um, let me see if I have anything else. No, that was it. So that was my main example. I couldn't remember if I put anything else in. But yeah, I thought this was a really great example of ChatGPT gives you technically the correct things, but there are different ways and better ways that you can code it. And if you don't know that, then you can run into a little bit of trouble. Well, there you go, folks. All right. And that brings us towards the end of round two everyone so someone said earlier smash that gong so yeah it is over for round one and round two ladies and gentlemen so with that being said that brings us to the q a portion so we'll uh, kind of knock some of these out all right let's take a look see okay lots of good stuff in here ah okay the infamous mark robbins wanted to know 99.94 percent of emails fail basic accessibility tests Will all this bad quality data mean AI will learn these bad habits? Who wants to take a stab at like that one? A, I feel like this is a Mark question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. No, is the I answer. think it can. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. like, that's what we, that's what we're kind of talking about, right? So, AI is only as good as the information we put it in. So, we need to. So, I guess we need to start feeding it good code, good accessible code, and that's why before I was like. It could be a great tool for making your emails more accessible if the code is already there, but it doesn't know what it doesn't know. So it needs, I guess it just needs to be fed more good code. Um, I am very on the fence whether I am willing to share any of my code with ChatGPT, so I haven't made that decision yet. <laughs> nope, totally agree with Megan. Yep. There you go. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Now, moving on, shall we? So, now that ChatGPT has plugins, basically an app store, how long do you think it will be before ESPs start integrating AI email coding into the platforms? It's kind of already started. They've not quite got the coding part, but they've started to include it for other things. Um, subject line prompts, or Megan said earlier, uh, Mailchimp has got a um, alt text generator for images. Yeah, they launched that a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, there's there's these things that are uh, slowly happening and more plugins yeah. are being created. I saw one just uh, today called uh, Code Wand, which you can kind of type in a text prompt and it will start the basic template for a whole app for you. So it'll set up GitHub, it'll set up Vercel, Next, everything all for you. And uh, so there's gonna be lots of integrations like that coming pretty quickly, especially ChatGPT's AI is not super expensive. Um, so to integrate it into your app is kind of a no-brainer for anyone who wants to start with AI into their app. So anyone is going to start adding things pretty soon, I think. Yeah, I don't know how quickly they'll add to like a small business ESP, though, where your main customer is depending on that drag and drop. Because you throw even AI-generated code in front of, you know, a one-person business, like, are they really going to want to have to deal with that i mean i don't know the answer to that um i i don't see it taking over something like a drag and drop editor anytime soon i think a drag and drop editor would be easier to use than trying to do it via ai i could see something like mid journey or dolly being used which is like a whole different rant that i have about ai generated art which me and jay have talked about i i guess i, I will just say i am not for ai generated art um, for a whole lot of reasons, 
Um, I went on a rant about that in a uh, podcast I was just on um, with Joy Brooks. Uh, so if you want that rant, you can go find that and you can do it. You can listen to that because I'm not going to do it here because we don't have time. Um, but I would not be surprised to see something like that happen. Um, but code, mm, I, I'm not quite. I'm not quite convinced that'll happen anytime soon. But I've been wrong before. Could be wrong now. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. All right, moving on, shall we? Okay. So, do we see a way that AI could help us find fixes for new bugs that email clients love to introduce when you're on a deadline? Do you think it could do this in its own or only work for suggestions? It could help if you kind of know what the problem is. Um, so one example that I, I think I've spoke about recently is that a couple of years ago, Gmail just stopped supporting the head styles for emails and only used the inline styles when they had a security breach. Um, so a lot of emails looked broken, but a, lot, a few people were like, I'm not really sure why it's looking broken. Um, so when the, I mean, the, the way that everyone figured it out was we all jumped on email geek slack and everyone was like, oh, I think it's doing this. I think it's doing that. And then someone came up with the answer and we figured out a fix. Um, but obviously that's a, a smaller group of email geeks talking about it. Whereas if you could feed the information into uh, chat GPT or something like that, or a tool like that, maybe it could answer a question like that. Um, so yeah, possibly the, uh, analyzing an image versus a code. I don't know how good it is at doing that. One thing uh, recently is um, Outlook on Mac OS stopped listening to align on table tags. So a lot of people's code started to not align properly. Um, by analyzing the code, you may, may have figured that out and then you can move the align tag to like a TD or something like that and that would fix it. Whether ChatGPT could look at it and say, oh, the reason this is not working is because this is not like being applied anymore, maybe. Um, there's, um, if there was better dev tools around email code, then maybe it would kind of figure these things out, but you can open like, uh, an email in Chrome and then you can inspect and it will tell you that your, uh, maybe your display property isn't working because you've applied position on it or something like that. And it's already worked out by looking at all of your code and it knows the rules of CSS. So I guess if that information is there, then it could help, um, but I, apart from like pasting in a piece of code and saying, why is this not working here? And then maybe it gets a good answer. I don't know at the moment if it can, if it can do that. I may test that for like Gmail. Like that, I, I didn't think of testing a prompt like that because because we know what Gmail is like really strict when it comes to your code. So like if you're missing a semicolon, um, it'll just throw out your entire style block and then your media queries won't work. And I'd be curious to see if you if you pop your code in and say, why isn't this working for Gmail? If it could spit back out, you're missing the semicolon online, whatever. Um, that would be interesting to see if it could do that yet. Um, again, it would need that information already in there. So somebody would have already had to feed it into there to be able to give that information back. And I don't know if anyone's done that work yet. Yeah, or the prompt would have to be something like, can you validate my CSS in this file? Yeah. And if you didn't know that you needed to validate your CSS, then you wouldn't be able to figure out the answer. So Right, right. Kind of or catch. didn't have that verbiage. Exactly. Right? Or, yeah, yeah. or even if you don't have that verbiage. Um, and even validating CSS and HTML for email through validators, I already feel like it's kind of weird because it'll do it for web. You can, And you have to have that knowledge of what to throw out from the validator because it'll say certain things are not valid when for email it is. Um, so yeah, I, I, it comes back to, you, you have to know how to code the email. And there you go, folks. And with that kind of being said on that one, this is the last question we got for the day, everyone. But uh, regarding coding, if AI coding does save email devs time, can we expect that email geeks will be able to spend time doing and learning to do more with email? Does less time with tedious coding mean more time to code something cool? Yeah. I could, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, or but, make like, an email design system and you're already there. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, yeah. Lots of brands already do that by getting all of that mundane templated stuff, like all easily done, like Megan's done with the design system and all the components she's made. And then she has time to make the MySpace email. Whereas before her time might have been spent just making those run of the day, like everyday newsletters. Right. So there's probably other ways. Um, but yeah, I, 
I think it will do those things. And that's like I mentioned before, it's going to take all of those mundane, repetitive like things and just make it a bit easier for you. Even you can, there's already some plugins out there where you can literally put in the link of a blog or put in the link of your, or of like an RSS feed and it will grab the content for you and put it into like where you need it. So maybe it will stop you having to copy and paste links and copy and CTAs and all that kind of stuff. Maybe it will do all those bits for you. So you'll just say, oh, in this module, add the links for this page and then it will just grab it all for you, add it to your email and it will be done. So it won't code it all for you, but it will make that little like that step obsolete for any email developer. I could see that. I could see that being a really good use. Um, I was actually thinking about that recently because um, I was reading a newsletter. I think it was Simon Harper's newsletter about how he puts his um, mail Mondays together. Um, and he always has a ton of links. He was talking about how manual it is. And I don't know if Simon's watching this or is going to watch this, but I had an idea for you. Um, but like, I'm wondering if like you, if with AI, you could do something like if you're gathering links for like, say your newsletter, if you put them all into a folder in your browser or somewhere else, if you could leverage AI or any really no code app, but we're talking about AI for leveraging AI to then tell it, hey, take everything in here style them in whatever style you need it, link them, write me like a short little summary and spit that out. I could see someone like that being really helpful and I wouldn't be against like that sort of use. Um, I, especially in like a personal newsletter that just helps you speed up your time to get out the door faster. And there you go, folks. All right. Perfect. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of this whole chat GPT versus email geeks webinar series that we've been doing. So first and foremost, I want to thank action rocket and email on acid and the mail jet and mail gun team for putting this sucker on uh, Jay, Megan, I enjoy hanging out with y'all any moment I get to thank you for stopping by and being here today, especially in your busy schedule. So thank you for being here. Appreciate it. No, oh, thanks for having us. I enjoy it, especially Blast. debating it with Megan. That's like a, <laughs> a weekly thing. So <laughs> Oh yes, it, it absolutely is. And if you're if you're oh, missing on the conversation, follow them on Twitter, and you can see this debate live <laughs> as it actually happens. So just a just a plug for that. <laughs> but awesome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, some other things to kind of cover before we get out of here. Uh, check out some of these amazing blogs from the Mailgun, Mailjet, and Email and Acid team on ChatGPT. Uh, we got some a lot of good stuff and log blog, a lot of blog content on that stuff that we, we've been talking about these last few weeks. Uh, another thing I want to talk about really quick is. Do not forget to sign up for the uh, Action Rocket Weekly newsletter at emailweekly.co. I'm going to throw that link in here as well. So feel free to sign up for their uh, their weekly newsletter and follow them over on their social channels. All right? Don't forget about that. And last but not least, uh, Megan is the host of one of our amazing shows that I get to work on as well, Notes from the Dev. If you haven't checked it out, throw that in here as well. Check that out on YouTube as well. It's super fun. Lots of fun. We have a new episode coming out really soon. And yes, he's coming on soon. He's coming on soon. So subscribe and he shows us some really neat things. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. And last but not least, I also produce a podcast for us on Mailgun. It's called Emails Not Dead. Check it out when you get a moment. Lots of fun. Megan's been on it. Got to get Jay on there too. That's the next thing we got to do. So we'll, we'll set some time up for that as well. Any excuse for us all to do anything together. Any time <laughs> for us to get to hang out on the internet. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, you too. Well, thanks again so much for being here. Thank I seriously you. appreciate it. I hope you guys have a great day. Um, and I'm going to play us out on some uh, some more uh, boxing-esque music. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. And hopefully we'll see you guys soon. All right, take care, everyone. <laughs>